Ladies and gentlemen, our special guest today is a world-renowned stand-up comedian, executive coach, and published author. He holds a master's degree in business administration from the University of Oxford. As an executive coach now, along with his career as a stand-up comedian, he has worked with 50-plus blue-chip companies across the globe. He's been invited to speak at the Harvard Business School and written for the Harvard Business Review as well. One of his articles on the beginner's mind was really impressive and a lot of information that I read recently. He has worked across cultures in over 25 countries. His life's mission is to lift other people up and help them be the best version of themselves. He has performed to full houses on Broadway and at the Sydney Opera House and won awards as Asia's and India's best stand-up comedian and performed over 2,000 shows on stages that include full houses um, across the world. His autobiography titled Naked was launched at the Jaipur Literature Festival and um, he loves uh, lifting people up and performing for Terminator ill patients as well in their hospital rooms. I'm talking about Papa CJ. Please welcome with a, him with a huge round of virtual applause. Hi, Simarji. Thank you for having me here. Hey, CJ, thank you so much for making it. We are really thrilled to have you. And uh, what an exciting journey you've been on. I read your book, uh, really impressive, and um, loads of takeaways, loads of similarities, unconventional in, in my journey and yours, a lot of unconventional decisions, a lot of breaking the barriers, a lot of pranks. And by the way, when you interview somebody like CJ, you must do your research because this is what he did. Uh, and I, <laughs> I read from his book. Um, 2009, he was doing a show in Chandigarh when a naive um, journalist who had not done her research uh, called him and said, you know what, my editor has asked me to do an interview with you, but I don't know who you are and what you do. This is the book I'm talking about, by the way. And so he pulled a prank and a very good I, I, one. I can tell you this story. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, basically this woman ahead. called and she said, my editor has told me to interview you and I have no idea who you are. Uh -huh. So I told her that I am a professional pole dancer. <laughs> And she said, what? I said, yes, I'm going to be doing pole dancing at the Chandigarh right. Golf Club. <laughs> this lady interviewed me for 25 minutes about pole right. dancing. Uh -huh. She called back with clarification questions, which I gave her. Right. And the next day, three newspapers wrote about how I was going to do stand-up comedy at the Chandigarh Golf Club. And this lady had on the front page of the newspaper... An article titled Poles Apart. <laughs> and yeah, that's, that's the article you have there. Right. Oh my goodness. Uh, Poles Apart. Papa CJ has no qualms about pole dancing. And um, so you pulled over. So, you you know, one better be careful when having an um, interview with you uh, is to do your research. I've done mine and um, I'd like to dive straight, straight into it. Um, CJ, you had a very comfortable uh, job back in the UK. You graduated from uh, a very good job with IBM, I believe, was one of your first employers. Yes. And um, you graduated from one of the best B schools in the world. Um, you know, the the version of the, the golden version of the Indian middle class dream, you had it all. And then you gave it up um, for stand up comedy. Tell us more about, you know, what prompted it? Uh, why such a major risk? And well, what's in it for those who are, who are wait, waiting on the fence right now? They want to pursue their passions, but they don't. Okay, there's quite a few different questions in there. I want to clarify one thing, though, that uh, I've learned that middle, middle class means something different in India to what it mm. means in some other countries. So in the UK, mm. middle class means you're quite well off. Mm. But in India, middle class does not mean that. It's mm. closer to what mo working class is uh, in places like the UK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you said I was quite comfortable in this job. Uh, I would beg to defer with you mm -hmm. in that from the outside, I mm. was very comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, I was supposedly in this, you know, we grew up in a culture which tells us you do your schooling, you do your college, you get a postgrad degree, you have, you get married, you have two children Kids. and then mm -hmm. you're so to say settled. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And that's the formula. And if you follow that track, then you're so to say successful. Uh -huh. But the, prob the problem is we grow up chasing a definition of success that has been defined by other people True. or that has been defined by society. Mm -hmm. And too many of us get in a situation where we've realized this so-called dream mm -hmm. and you realize that you're not so happy. Mm -hmm. with, re with regard to people, you know, pursuing their passion, mm -hmm. it's very fashionable nowadays to say, oh, pursue your passion, follow your right. heart. Yep. Passion, passion doesn't necessarily put food on the table. 
Absolutely. So I believe there is a balance you need to find in that. Yes, you want to feed your soul, but you need to feed your stomach as well. Mm. I mean, today, if you look at Shah Rukh Khan, who is one of the biggest superstars in the Indian Bollywood industry, mm-hmm. even he dances at weddings, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think there is a rites of passage with every artistic prof- profession. There's some things you do to feed the soul, and right. there's some things you do because you just need to finance, bring in the money that allows you to do the activities that feed the soul. Sure. With me, with me, what happened was I spent four years working in a consulting firm in London. Mm-hmm. I was able to pay back all my student loans. Right. And then I took a year off, mm-hmm. and I went to the Edinburgh Festival in Scotland. Right. And I saw somebody doing stand-up comedy for the first time. Mm-hmm. And I was blown away. I mean, here's a guy on stage. He's got a microphone in one hand, mm-hmm. a beer in the other, mm. and he's just having fun. And that's having the time job. of his life. Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Wow, this is amazing!" You know, I've got to do this. Uh-huh. So I, I chucked up my job. I did 250 shows in 10 months. Right. At the at the end of it, I was completely broke. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, because you, you know the way it works is you wake up at 10:30, 11. You cook right. one meal for yourself at two in the afternoon. Right. You get into some comedian's car to go to some city in the UK. You're traveling three or four hours. Uh-huh. You get there, you do the show, you're, uh, you're nervous so you don't eat. Sometimes you can't afford to because, you know, the pub is uh, expensive. Right. You get dropped off on the outskirts of London at two o'clock in the morning. Uh-huh. You pay the driver your share of petrol. You're not getting mm-hmm. paid for any of these shows. Mm-hmm. And you change three different buses to get home, sometimes waiting for 45 minutes in cold London winter. Well, I've done that and too, but not, not for shows. You know, I've done that for leisure and clubbing and other things in London, but, <laughs> not, but exactly. not for a living. You, right. get there, you get home at 4.35 in the morning. By uh-huh. the end of that year, you have no money, no friends, no relationships and no life. Mm. But every single comedy promoter in the country knows your name. Right. So that's kind of how it started out. But I, I, I need to... And then, of course, after a year, I went broke and I took a job. I used to work in the day. I used to perform at night. Mm. I used to work for this uh, recruitment firm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, nowadays it's fashionable to say, oh, I'm hustling. Mm -hmm. What I used to do is I used to go to restaurants and they have this little bowl where you can put in your business card. Mm. And, you know, at the end of the month, one will get pulled out. You get a free meal or something. Right, right. When When nobody was looking, I used to steal those business cards. Mm -hmm. cold call these guys, place them into jobs and get commissions. And that's what allowed me to finance my my comedy habit. Oh, that's that's the definition of hustle then. (laughs) Yeah, in fact, I I remember when I used to go to airports, in those days you had these business centers in these airports where they had Mm -hmm. a few terminals and you Mm -hmm. could surf the internet. Mm -hmm. When nobody was looking, I used to go to every single terminal, open the browser, and change the homepage to papacj.com. Of course, and that's what you've done today when you when you logged on on for this interview. You got Ooh, you, you're, you're Papa boom. CJ, and and then in the brackets, papacj.com. Right, never miss an opportunity to hustle. I love that entrepreneurial spirit. That's really powerful. Um, I want to dig a little bit deeper, CJ, into the motivation, into the drive, into the the risk taking, because um, yeah. you know a lot of people go through these experiences. They watch somebody yeah. doing what they would like to do for the rest of their lives. And they say, wow, you know, look at this guy, look at this person. Two aspects I want to take a deeper dive in. One is how it appears from the outside, you know, like your life, as you said, might appear different, like full of glamour and, you know, doing, you know, living the dream. And then the other side, as you mentioned, you know, the nervousness, the anxiety, the travel, the odd hours, the not making enough money, the struggle behind. I want to talk about that a little bit. One. Second is people go through these experiences and then they don't follow through they don't they they remain stuck um i don't know who said it but uh, it, they, there was this uh, philosophical quote on the internet which said most people are leading lives of quiet desperation um and i think that's true for millions especially in the corporate sector right they, they're stuck they came with that energy and then somehow so, lost it along the way so, so Ajit, you need to mm. you need to start reading some more cheerful stuff man <laughs> well, uh, this is well. <laughs> this is my Look way of. This is my way of. Speaker goes. Motivational speaker goes seeking misery so he can motivate those people. This is what well, you call market segmentation. <laughs> li- 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 living, th- living through misery, uh, experiencing it, witnessing it, seeing it around you, and then um, trying to figure out why is that people still choose to be in that misery. So w- without understanding the pain, there's no coming out of it. So uh, t- talk to us about I'm, your story. I'm, I'm pulling your legs, Imajit. I'm pulling <laughs> no, your legs. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're having a good time uh, with yeah. this chat. So... Um, 
Talk to us about your your journey from those two aspects. One it one is how fame appears on the outside, uh, and the the other side of it, the struggle of it, and two the ability to jump for something, to go for something when your heart says yes, this is you. You were meant for this. You, okay, you know I've never been drawn to fame per se. Uh-huh. You know it just happens to be a byproduct of what I do. Mm. My motivation is like you said at the start is to make people feel better to uplift them mm. and it translates it manifests itself in multiple outlets sure whether it is stand up comedy and making people laugh uh-huh. whether it's a little bit like what you do in terms of motivational speaking mm-hmm. whether it's executive coaching or corporate training and equipping people to realize their dreams mm-hmm. whether it's going into hospitals and making you know patients laugh mm-hmm. uh, this was pre- yeah uh, I, saw, I saw the videos pre- i saw the videos pre-co- yeah pre covid mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's just you know I put out an offer saying if somebody needs to have a conversation. Mm-hmm. In fact, I've currently posted a concept called the Chief Caffeine Officer, right. where at, at an organization you can invite me to just have conversations with your people, you mm-hmm. know, for coffee for, conversation yeah. and a boost. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because my background is so varied from an ideation point of view, from a humor point of view, from a coaching point of view. Yeah. And sometimes people just need a conversation to change mm-hmm. the way they. look at their lives uh-huh. you know there's there's the concept of a trim tab which is uh, i don't know if you're familiar with the trim tab nope. i think Steve, stephen covey wrote about it uh-huh. it's a small lever that controls uh-huh. a small rudder right. that controls the larger rudder that controls the direction of the entire right. boat or the ship sure sure and a tiny little shift in that can change the entire direction of where you end up in your life mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i would love to be able to have those kind of conversations with people mm-hmm. you know So for example one of the conversations i have and i'll ask you this question i know you're the interviewer though mm-hmm. is if you had let's say you had a billion dollars in the bank mm-hmm. you know bill gates kind of money mm-hmm. how would you spend your time mm-hmm. not what would you buy how would mm-hmm. you spend your time mm-hmm. what's it, what's what's your answer to that question well freedom to do the things that i really wanted to do without worrying about the financial repercussions of that so yeah i'll be freed up there'll be suddenly a whole lot of freedom to actually rethink but that's a genetic answer what would you actually do why well, for me personally yeah i do more of what i'm doing and you know i'll go full on you know this suddenly it's suddenly like uh, maybe there are no worries about any new initiative you don't have to worry about how will this play out etc etc the domain the playground for me is going to remain pretty much the same but it'll be far more aggressive far more carefree far more risk taking and things like that yeah Okay I'm just my memory is terrible so bring me back to this because I mm-hmm. have something to say about that. Sure. So normally if I ask a 23 year old this question mm-hmm. you know he or she will say oh I'll travel I said okay where will you go I'll go mm-hmm. to Europe for how long one month mm-hmm. When you actually do the mathematics there used to be a book called Europe on $50 a day it was a mm-hmm. Thomas guide mm-hmm. What I'm trying to get them to is that the cost of your dreams mm-hmm. is far lower than whatever imaginary number you may have in your head mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the fact is we never do that mathematics mm. right so we keep thinking oh i'm going to work till the age of you know 50 or or 40 or whatever it is get so much money and then i'll do whatever i want yeah we conditioned to think like that you know by parents and society and by the system even if we yeah. have the money to say no you know uh, save it for a rainy day you know too early so for fo- you yeah my follow up question to that is how much money do you need until you die Mm-hmm. Right. So if I was to ask you that, mm-hmm. the calculation I'd like you to do is calculate how much money you need until the day you die. Account for inflation, holidays, children's education, the works. Mm-hmm. Subtract what you already have. Mm. Right. And you've got a balanced number. Mm-hmm. Div- divide that by the number of years you plan to work. Mm. Most people who do that calculation find out that they're working far harder than they need to work. Right. And they're al- already earning more than they need to earn. Mm-hmm. Which brings you back to question one. Why are you then not living the life of your dreams? Mm. Yeah, good mathematical you know, uh, logic there. Although I'm pretty bad at mathematics, but yeah, I I understand the logic. But we're all chasing this definition of success that's defined by others. We're comparing right. ourselves with, oh, this guy's done so much. I should mm-hmm. be trying to do as much. Mm-hmm. We waste our, I mean, we waste our health trying to get this money, right. and then we spend all our money trying to regain our health. Yep, which we so, which we can't do that when I mean, we realize that we're miserable. and i'm going to come back to the point you mentioned about what uh-huh. you would do if you had a billion dollars is sure. and i think it's it's the same for every artist right we go through this uh, process of evolution 
Yep. So when we start, I want the confidence that I can make people laugh. I'll right. go for the easy joke. I'll go for the stereotype joke. Uh-huh. Uh, then, then there's observational comedy. Then we'll do uh, stuff that makes us look cool or sound intelligent. You know, you'll do uh-huh. uh, or what's called edgy in comedy. You'll use bad language. You'll pick on positions mm-hmm. of authority. Mm-hmm. But I think eventually the journey is inwards because both you and I operate in a profession where there are no rules, there are no boundaries, there are no guidelines. Mm. So you have to ask yourself, what are the things that I value? What are Mm -hmm. the things that I care about? What is my personality? Mm -hmm. You know, we call that finding your voice. And then eventually your, your audience, your audience finds you, Mm -hmm. you know, the people who don't like your stuff will weed themselves out automatically because you're not pretending to be somebody else. Otherwise you build an audience based on uh, something that is not authentic. Mm -hmm. So I would argue for somebody like yourself, Mm -hmm. you don't need, you don't need the billion dollars to go all out or be more aggressive or do that's who you are, you know, Mm -hmm. and you're already in a place where you can do that. You know, let them celebrate the true you. No, of course, of course. Uh, I I appreciate that. That, That's a valid point. Uh, But the, there is a sort of additional psychological security that comes with knowing having a billion dollars in the bank that allows you. And as you rightly said, one can tap into that psychological safety way before even having the money in your bank account. It's more a mental block that we need to overcome uh, in, in the process. In fact, in, fact, I, in fact, I would argue that the billion dollars may be more of a hindrance, mm. you know. Well, if you let it, because if you let it. Yeah, you might lose that. Uh, you know, I've seen so many people who lose that sense of hunger, mm. you know. Uh, in fact, I would say I'm an example of that. You know, mm. in my first three years, I did 700 shows. I was right. on the road every day. Mm-hmm. But now that I suppose life has got a little bit more comfortable, I'm picking and choosing. Mm-hmm. I'm aware of the fact that I'm in a comfortable position that allows me to take the kind of shows I want to take, allows me to experiment with, uh, you know, with leadership and comedy and combining the two and coaching. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whereas I didn't have that luxury earlier. You know, mm-hmm. there were things that I had to do. Mm-hmm. So my growth rate was like this in mm-hmm. the days of sort of hunger and poverty. Mm-hmm. Whereas now it is definitely not at the same pace because I'm like, nah, it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. M- money, I believe, I've always believed and uh, invite your views on that as well, should be a liberating force. It should not tie you down. And uh, ironically, that's what it ends up being is ends up being a prison. And then you want to pass it on to the next generation. Many people do. Many, many miserable careers are created on the desire of the parents to say, you know, listen, kid, you know, I've I spent my entire life studying medicine. I built this hospital. Now it's running. So you've got to be a doctor. Even if you want to be a cricketer, I don't care. Yeah. You have to be a doctor, even if you'll be yeah. a miserable doctor for the rest of your life. Uh, and I think yeah. I like the logic there about that calculation that um, you don't, you probably overestimating what you need to live your dream. In fact, in fact, you touched on something which I do want to add in mm. that mm. in terms of, you know, being able to follow my passion, like you mentioned, Mm. I was very fortunate because I have a set of parents who gave me everything and gave me nothing. Mm. Uh, Let me explain. They gave me everything in that Mm -hmm. the support systems were always there. Mm -hmm. You know, even as a kid, I remember my dad said, if you want to be a sweeper, you be a sweeper, but be the best in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we've we've all had parents who said that, but they always gave me a support system saying, you know, go out, follow your heart, you know, we've got your back. Mm. But when I say they gave me nothing, at no point did they ever try and manipulate me or Mm. channelize me saying, be a doctor, be a lawyer, be a whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Yes, it it was always there saying you need to stand on your own feet and support yourself, Mm -hmm. which, you know, which is why I said that bit about feeding the stomach. Mm -hmm. But if you can, I mean, I go and talk to you know, young girls from underprivileged backgrounds in schools. Mm -hmm. And I tell them that financial independence is the only independence, Mm -hmm. you know. So I was very fortunate to have parents who taught me the importance of financial independence and yet never tried to uh, make me pursue a path that was a path of their dreams. Sure. You know, Uh, so Mm -hmm. I think that was one of my and has always been my biggest blessing. Well, that's wonderful. And coming from my serious um, perspective about things, um, I think it was Carl Jung who said the biggest burden any child can carry are the unlived dreams of the parents. 
the biggest burden any child can carry are the unlived dreams of the parents and yet so many young children that we see today are carrying those dreams right yeah. and as you rightly said uh, give them the liberty as parents we should give them the liberty to pursue what they want to pursue right khalil gibran said it yeah. beautifully he said uh, your children are not your children they're the sons and daughters of life itself they come through you but not from you and though they are with you yet they belong not to you and th- this is the number one challenge with our system as we sort of try to take over say god you did a wonderful job for the 9 months uh, yeah. in the womb and now we'll take it over from here and we know what's best for this child <laughs> what's your message to parents um, cj who might be tuning in to help raise healthy happy children because you're in the business of bringing smiles and you know uplifting humanity healthy See, happy no, not just I'm successful no expert, i'm no expert on parenting but what mm. i will say is that i think what's very important is to always have clear communication mm-hmm. and in any relationship i believe your relationship is always better when you focus more on listening mm-hmm. than on talking sure. because when you listen you're able to understand who they are as human beings what their hopes and dreams are mm-hmm. and it's also important not to instantly react you know mm-hmm. because when a parent instantly reacts to something that their child is saying mm-hmm. which the parent may not like mm-hmm. then the child immediately is on guard mm-hmm. and you never Defensive. want to get your child into a position where they stop sharing with you sure. you know so i think that communication and transparency is always important but again uh, i'm no expert in parenting so uh, i'm not really qualified to give advice no uh, coming coming so from your experience advice i give is yeah coming is coming from advice. your experience right mm-hmm. yeah great uh let's go back to your um journey um in startup comedy and um, um and your first time on stage which i believe uh, as you mentioned in your book was uh end of october 2004 if i'm correct absolutely right F- for for the first time on stage and your introduction yeah. uh, malcolm hardy uh, was introducing you saying the next guy is probably going to be shit please welcome papa cj um, yeah so Mm-hmm. For, for for starters that was more a reflection of malcolm hardy than me he was mm-hmm. a an infamous fig- figure in the uk comedy circuit he had gone to jail uh, he had uh, done lots of things. he stole freddy mercury's birthday cake he mm-hmm. stole somebody's car and that's how he introduced most acts mm-hmm. uh, but yeah back to your question sir sorry no no so um, were you nervous of course mm-hmm. i mean like they say public speaking is one of the greatest fears in the world Mm-hmm. and i was going up on stage on a boat called the wibbly wobbly boat on okay. the river thames right which was f- which was famous for being a really rough night mm-hmm. uh, and the UK, the uk comedy circuit it's not like going to the theater where you know people watch and they smile and they clap mm-hmm. when you do gigs in pubs and boats they are rowdy yeah. they will heckle you right. they will abuse you right and this gig was known to be quite rough uh-huh. but uh, i think that first gig went quite well uh, and so here i am Yeah and yet um, public speaking is the number one fear in the world ahead of death and <laughs> some people would rather be dead than be on stage presenting to an audience um, yeah. your your from your journey what are your top um, insights into this and overcoming nervousness and a lot of people are not able to live their full potential just because they're afraid of finding their voice or expressing themselves I think what's really important to understand mm-hmm. uh and you would have got this through my book naked and the show as well if you uh, if you get a chance to see it mm-hmm. is i use the vehicle of my life but i'm talking about the human experience sure so when people are reading the book just as it happened with you mm-hmm. they don't feel like i'm talking about just my life it's like i'm talking about their life as well mm-hmm. because there are so many shared experiences and emotions you know we've all been through heartbreak we've all been through fa- failure we've all been through various things So I think it's important when you get on stage. I mean the tips that I give people when you're giving a presentation the greatest confidence booster is knowing that you have the ability to say I don't know. Mm-hmm. If somebody asks you a question saying I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that but mm-hmm. I can find out and come back to you. Sure. Also it's knowing that the people you're presenting to or performing in front of they're human beings just like you. you know mm-hmm. everybody everybody is flawed in some way or the other mm-hmm. and it's perfectly fine to make a mistake mm-hmm. you know don't be afraid of being judged because none of us are perfect mm-hmm. and you know there are various uh, the kind of tips that i give is 
So one of the things is if you now if I stood like really close to you, mm. you know, you'd be uncomfortable because you know you'd feel that was your personal space. Sure. So one of the tips I do is, uh, I'd say you know just close your eyes and imagine what your personal space is, then expand it and expand it and expand it until it fills the entire size of the whole room. Mm. Then when you walk on stage, you're gonna walk in as if, you know, in Hindi we have a saying which says "Mere baap ka raja." Mm. which means you know it's my father's kingdom mm. uh, there was a there was a very old uh, bollywood film uh, a film in indian cinema called mughle azam mm. where there is one character who plays the emperor mm-hmm. and in those days the shoes that were bro- bought for him in that role cost 25000 rupees right you know, in today's day and age that we would be equivalent to you know 2.5 million Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, 25 lakhs uh, for those watching in India. Now the producer was asked. He said, "You know, do you really need to buy a pair of shoes for that this expensive. character who's playing the emperor that cost that much?" Mm-hmm. He says, "No, I don't." But when that actor knows that he is wearing a pair of shoes that cost 25,000 rupees, mm-hmm. the way he will walk, that is what I want to capture. Mm. So do you get that feel when you walk on stage with that presence and know that it's okay to be wrong? I, and you, I n- mm-hmm. and I never get on stage and say that this is what the answer is or this mm-hmm. is what is correct. Mm-hmm. Right? I just get on stage and say based on my experience this is what I believe. Mm. I cannot possibly be wrong because I'm talking about my experience, Your experience and what right. I have learned. Mm-hmm. It's not mm-hmm. a blanket statement. Right. You know and uh, the other one, if I'm allowed to say it, uh, it's slightly naughty. If you want, you can edit it out. And this is more relevant for the women who are speaking than the men. Is that uh, confidence is like an orgasm. <laughs> you know, you can fake it. Most people don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. But uh, so, any tips on f- uh, tapping into that space where you, you have the same swag and the same feeling of wearing the 25 lakh rupees shoes or, you know, or, or uh, you know, getting into that mental space? Do you, do you have, what are CJ's top um, mental hacks before going on stage before, because you've been in a lot of firsts. You were the first Indian yeah. comic uh, in the Melbourne Comedy Festival, Just for Laughs, Montreal, yeah. many other places across the world. You've, you've, you've been the first. Any fa- favorite mental hacks before you go on stage? I think just one, you should know the subject you're talking about. Two, you should know that it's perfectly okay to be wrong or perfectly mm-hmm. open to, okay to slip up, mess up. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, just enjoy yourself and be authentically you. You know, uh-huh. don't, uh, uh, don't be there to impress, be there to express. Sure. You know? sure. uh, like they say, you shouldn't be there to prove yourself, but to improve yourself. Wow, I love and that. If, if something goes wrong, just learn from it and be better the next time. You know, mm-hmm. every speaking opportunity, everything is a learning opportunity. Uh-huh. You know, in my, in my profession as a comedian, you learn nothing from success. Mm-hmm. You get on stage, you do a good show, you walk off thinking, boss, I'm the best. In a bad show, you get feedback every 15 seconds. Right. Every 15 seconds, you are judged. Mm. If they're not laughing, you're failing. Right. And there's nothing scarier, you know, like you earlier said, than mm-hmm. trying to make people laugh and getting five minutes of silence. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And if you don't have the experience or the expertise to fix it, uh-huh. you have to ask yourself on the way home, if I'm ever again in front of a similar audience in the same country, right. what can I do differently so I don't look like a fool? Sure. And that is what helps you grow. So for us, failure is actually the only way to get better. Uh-huh. You know, today uh, we have to keep failing in multiple different situations so you learn how to deal with those. I agree with that. You know? Definitely. Uh, yeah. yeah we, I mean, today we when had I, a, when, uh, when, uh, sorry. Go on, go on, go on. I mean, today when I do, uh, I run a training session. You mm-hmm. know, it's a, one of my signature modules, which is called A Comedian's Guide to Communication Strategy. Okay. One of, one of the things I talk about is that one of the best pieces of advice I got when I was starting uh-huh. out Right. was that it's very important for you to grow in the dark because when you hit the limelight, mm. you, don't have the freedom, you don't have the freedom to screw up. Right. right? You can't oh, make mistakes then. They're so very expensive guy, mistakes. He's so right. famous. Uh-huh. And you go there and you're like, ah, he's kind of okay. Uh, didn't live up to now, the expectations. Now, the problem is, right. 
yeah, now the problem is if you always want to succeed, mm -hmm. you keep playing safe. Right. You keep doing the stuff that you know will always work. You, you don't mm -hmm. innovate. You don't right. grow. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? We go to small open mic nights where there's mm -hmm. 20 people in the audience, 30 people in the audience, unannounced. You'll take a piece of paper with 20 different new things. You'll try it out. You'll see what works. You'll see what doesn't work. And the stuff that works, you know, you'll bring it in to your normal set. Nice. So the question I ask organizations or experienced professionals is, where is your open mic night? You know, mm. where do you go to make your mistakes? To innovate. Where do you go to innovate, to experiment, to try different things? Which markets, which products, you know, wh wh what do you want to try? Mm -hmm. And that is so important because sure. unless you sort of hit the gym, unless you mm. practice, you know, you're, you're going to be no good at match time. No, well said. Well said. I completely relate with that about the failures are the best teachers. You know, we had an incident where uh, back in the days when I was just starting out on this journey of being a trainer and speaker, etc. We had a request from a company to do a team building event. Now, we did mm -hmm. not. We said yes to it. And that, that's my usual approach. If you don't know how to do something, say yes and figure out as you because there's enough, enough time. In it. Yeah, right. <laughs> But perhaps there was not enough time to figure it out or we could not do the best we could have done in that time. Yeah. So long story short, 40 people, international gathering, uh, team building, full day events. We didn't. We had some activities which more, you know, sort of more intellectual, et cetera, et cetera. Did not have a lot of those hands-on outdoor uh, sort of team building activities. So one, one hour later into this event, I felt it's, it's, you know, it's not working out and I could sense it from, from the audience. And somehow managed to get through the day. You know, thankfully there was cricket outside, always cricket to fall back on. <laughs> they had this, yeah. um, it was in the JP Noida, um, some facility, they have a lot of outdoor sport uh, sports there. So yeah. we sailed through the day somehow. I could still sense the discomfort from the audience. Came back yeah. that day, next week itself, you know, got yeah. this carpenter guy and looked up YouTube videos, created all this different sort of equipment for a variety of team building games, as a result of which we have not one but 20 activities, different takeaways to choose from. That one single incident taught us a lot. Yeah. Second thing you said about, that was beautiful, by the way, uh, what's your open mic night? Where, where do you test ideas? And I think, um, you talk about innovation and garages and startups and uh, uh, they, they happen in a, a garage and somewhere across the world. That's where a lot of the new ideas are coming from. And yeah. as you succeed, somehow you don't want to take a chance. You don't want to rock the boat. So you do more of what you've done and that can be yeah. counterproductive when, when things change. Look at how this whole yeah. virtual medium has evolved. You know, uh, people doing yeah. virtual presentations uh, and all that changing with the times. So, th yeah. so thank you for that. Very valuable. Um, CJ, I'd like to uh, again go back to your journey because uh, I think a lot of learning will emerge for our audience from, you know, from the turning points. You enrolled for a course uh, for stand-up comedy uh, in September of that year before you were to do your first gig. Uh, yeah. Most of your classmates, you write in your book, were young white men who were not so subtle when mocking you and hinting that they thought that you weren't funny and that you did not have any future in comedy at all. Mm -hmm. As fate would have it, none of those young men are in comedy business today. And you, my friend, uh, are in, represented India on international stages across the world. Now, two things. When, when that sort of, so you were obviously new, you're learning. When that sort of direct, not so subtle, hard hitting, negative feedback comes in. Yeah. A, how, do, how do people deal with, how should, what are your suggestions? How should people deal with that? That's one. And let's go with that first and then. I think each person has you know, their own approach. I've, uh, as a child, I was always a fan of Sachin Tandilkar, the cricketer. Uh -huh. And he would have, uh, you know, opponents sort of try and mock him or, you know, egg him on. And he let his bat do the talking. Mm -hmm. So for me, I just put my head down and did mm -hmm. my work. Mm -hmm. Also, I was, I mean, I was the only Indian comedian in mm -hmm. all of the UK. Right. I hadn't, I hadn't grown up there. I didn't follow their politics. I didn't have the same cultural references. Right. Of course. And, you know, sometimes people spoke to me and said, Hey, you know, why do you talk about being Indian? You mm. know, uh, people are going to pigeonhole you and call you the Indian comedian. Mm. But my point of view was that if I don't talk about my country and my people and bring my mm. perspective, mm -hmm. then what's going to make me different? Because sure. that's who I am. Sure. You know, and for me, it was very important to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I also did very consciously was that 
often people from my country and uh, I won't say community, but uh, Indians were mocked. You know, they were viewed as the as the news agent or the taxi driver, mm. and you thought you could. Seven uh, Eleven son. Yeah. Yeah, you thought you could always stereotype them and make fun of right. them. Mm -hmm. And I used to always try and represent my my country in a positive light. Right. And when I was heckled by a table of you know skinhead football hooligans, mm. I made sure that I found the biggest guy in that group. Uh -huh. And I destroyed, I literally destroyed him in front of all his friends and 200 other people in their comedy club <laughs> with the hope that the next time he walked on the street and he saw an Indian guy, yeah. he would think twice before, you know, passing a racist remark or, or right. mocking that person. Wow. Mm -hmm. now that's a good take at it. Fight, fight back and st uh, stand up for what you believe in. Let your bat do the talking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just yeah. put your head down and work. And I think it's really important to not let your ego get mm -hmm. ahead of your talent. If you can be humble mm -hmm. and kind to people mm -hmm. and, you know, be able to weed out the feedback as to who's doing it from a negative point of view. Uh -huh. But if there is any truth behind it, what can you learn from it so you can improve and grow? Sure. I remember uh, when I was in the UK, mm -hmm. I did about, uh, like I said, 700 shows in three years. 400 of them would have been out of London. Mm -hmm. And I was always the new guy at these shows. But I was mm -hmm. in the car with two other comedians who had been right. doing it for be between 10 and 20 years. Uh -huh. I saw how they prepared their shows. I saw how they analyzed it afterwards. I begged them to watch me perform and give me feedback afterwards. I've spent over 2000 hours in cars with comedians who have been doing stand-up comedy for between 10 and 20 years. Mm -hmm. that, that was comedy university for me. You know, right. I was literally just soaking it in and soaking it Learning in. from all these people. Mm -hmm learning and literally begging, saying, please teach me, please give me feedback. You know, I would go to a room, perform, not be able to handle it, and then watch how these guys would enter the same room right. and be able to take charge. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there is no substitute for, for that kind of learning. So I think it's very important to just always keep your ego in check, be humble, mm -hmm. realize mm -hmm. that even when people lash out at you, mm -hmm. sometimes you know, you don't know what, what their experience is, sure. you know, so they're maybe through. they're having a bad day, maybe they're going through stuff. Of course. Uh, if, if there is something to it, uh, you know, take it on board, learn from mm -hmm. it and grow. Uh, but sometimes the other guys just, just destroy <laughs> him. <laughs> <Beep>. <laughs> no, grow through what you go through. You've been a testimony of that. And then, you know, you did very well for yourself in the UK, you know, in terms of you had this identity and you were uh, performing shows back to back and then relocating back to India. Talk to us about that. Uh, how did this affect your journey? And um, as you look back at it, what are, what are your thoughts? You know, because... Um, there's, there's a lot of nostalgia about the UK that I can sense in the conversation that we've had so far. And how does that uh, um, see, fit in? See, there's a, there's a nostalgia about the UK because I learned my craft there. You know, mm -hmm. So my style of comedy is also very British. And uh, the beautiful thing about comedy in the UK is that it is a way of life. Uh -huh. you know, in, there are some cultures, so in the West Coast in the US, it's, it's a means to an end. You know, I'm going to mm -hmm. do some stand-up, I'll get noticed and then I'll get on TV or I'll get a film or a sitcom. Right. Whereas in the UK, live comedy, people do comedy for the sake of doing live comedy. You know, okay. every city or town has a comedy club. So I think that's really, uh, that was wonderful, which is why I'm nostalgic about the UK. And I'm still passionate about the live art form. I don't do much stuff online. And, you know, I don't think it makes sense to leave the corporate world, join a creative field, and then be in a rat race in the creative field, mm -hmm. you know. I'm very happy that other people are doing what they're doing. I wish them all the success, mm -hmm. but I'm going to do the things that I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. With regard to moving back to India, you know, I'm, a, I'm doing a session quite soon on leadership, leadership without a title. Right. And one of the questions that I'm being asked is about, you know, where are moments that you have really demonstrated your leadership? Uh -huh. But I think, I believe that leadership is the management of energy. And mm. more than anybody else's, it starts with you, with managing mm. your own energy. It's leadership by example. Sure. And a lot of that is about living a life that is true to your values, mm -hmm. whatever they might be. Mm -hmm. So when I moved back to India, I had just gone to the US, done this huge TV show called Last Comic Standing. You know, 15 million people, I, I think, had watched it. Uh, mm. I had a work permit to work in the US. This was a big break. 
mm-hmm. but i had just moved back to india after 8 mm-hmm. years of being in the uk i wanted to be home you know i'm right. very indian this is my home i wanted to be close to my family sure. uh, my father hadn't been keeping well and that is what was more important to me mm-hmm. so i think as human beings we have the opportunity to demonstrate leadership every day mm-hmm. by being true to our values mm-hmm. and for me that was important and i remember when i moved back to india uh, there was no english language stand up comedy in sure. the way that i had been practicing mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. but i said no problem yeah i'll start the circuit Mm. So I started off the English language comedy circuit in Delhi. Right. And uh, I supported that ecosystem until it you know had enough uh, steam to run on its own. Mm. And uh, slowly things picked up. But also I think coming back to India was wonderful for me as a comedian because like I said earlier when I performed in the UK I hadn't grown up there. I wasn't mm. I didn't have the same cultural references. Sure. So I was telling jokes, you know. Mm-hmm. I was like here's a joke here's a joke here's a joke you mm-hmm. know and almost at some level there was a sense in at least in the very early days you want them to like you you know so right. like here's my joke please like me you know uh-huh. Uh-huh. and you you speak in an accent that is comfortable for them to understand right but when i came back when i came to india this is a country i've grown up in so mm-hmm. now i can do 45 minutes on stage without telling one pre-planned or pre-written joke just conversation to the audience mm-hmm. uh, and so when i came back to india i was i mean here i was performing in front of my people mm-hmm. and it made me a lot more fluid as mm-hmm. a comedian you know it mm-hmm. taught me how to uh, be more conversational uh, and fluid as a performer mm-hmm. and then i was able to take that craft sure. and take it beyond my borders So mm-hmm. now when I go back to the UK or I mean I've performed in 25 different countries right I am able to have that same level of fluidity uh-huh as a performer which which is what which is something that India gave me that 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 con- that spontaneity perhaps and that you know you people you could go, uh, there's so much there's movies there's culture popular culture that we grew up in there's politics there's so many things that would not need any effort at all when you're speaking to a home audience right but i think more than the, the actual content uh, uh-huh. simajit it was the comfort with uncertainty right mm. you know crowd work is something that is very difficult to do sure because unlike you can't a prepare joke, for that where, right mm. yeah unlike a joke where you know i'm going to say these lines and they're mm. going to laugh with crowd work you have a conversation somebody mm. says something you've got to instantly make it funny on the spot right you right know? Mm-hmm. that's very difficult and i think a large part of life i mean when and when i when, when i coach as well there's a principle called confident uncertainty mm. right life is always going to be that. uncertain confident it's always going it's mm-hmm. always going to throw things at you that mm-hmm. you're not expecting right but you need to be able to carry yourself with the confidence that you know what no matter what comes my way I i'm going to be able to deal with it very good no? very good like that so yeah CJ help us with the the creative process please you know when when you write your jokes or when you visualizing being on that stage when you're thinking you're sort of anticipating I'll say this and this is what the reaction is going to be like or this is how I'd like the reaction to be and you know so you write yeah. it down do you rehearse it what's the writing process uh, with with the perspective of helping our viewers and listeners be more creative in their communication in order to connect with other people better I think again it comes down to like I mentioned earlier listening and observing. Okay. There are there are some people so Jerry Seinfeld for example would sit right. down every day in front of a pad and paper uh-huh. and write for 3 hours. You know and wow. something will come out. Mm. I don't have that level of discipline. Okay. But I'm always paying attention to mm-hmm. things that are going on around me. If I see something that has the potential uh, to be funny or there's an idea, I will immediately write it down. and then one day i'll sit down with these 50 ideas and try and turn them into jokes mm-hmm. again you don't know what's going to work until you take it on to stage sure you know so take it on to stage see what works if it doesn't work try it differently play with right. the idea uh, so there's and also i think it's really important not to not to make yourself fit a box mm. right i'm not a comedian i'm not a motivational speaker i'm not mm. an author i'm mm-hmm. papa cj right and mm-hmm. that encompasses all of it mm-hmm. i remember when i did my show naked for the first time mm-hmm. 
20 minutes in that are deadly serious mm. and serious to the point that people are in tears when they watch it. They're deeply emotional bits. And I remember somebody telling me, saying, what's wrong with you? You know, you're mm. a comedian. How can you do this stuff? Right, right. And I fortunately did not listen to them. Mm -hmm. And the greatest strength of that show is not the comedy. I mean, a lot of it is funny, but is that emotional roller coaster that the audience goes through. Mm -hmm. And you'll get a feel for that from the book, which you've already read. Right. You know, so mm -hmm. I don't think you should be pressured to, to meet the expectations of outsiders. Right. You know, if you can be authentic to yourself and give them a genuine experience, that audience doesn't need to agree with you, but right. they need to be able to relate to where you're coming from. Right. So you need to just build that bridge uh, and your home safe. So I would yep. say the two things, uh, mm -hmm. when you're presenting or talking or mapping out your journey, you've always got to think in advance, two things. One is what do I, firstly, why, why, why should they give a crap? Why mm. does that audience in front of you care about what you have to say? We mm. live in a world of limited attention spans, right. right? Why should they spend their time listening to me? So what's in mm. it for them? Mm -hmm. And the second thing you need to outline, and I'm sure you do this as a motivational speaker, is at the end of their interaction or experience or, or presentation or show with you, what do you want them to think, feel or do mm -hmm. as a result? Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, it's very important that I know uh, the feeling I want to leave them with. Right, right. You know, how do I want them to feel at the end of this experience? Sure. So that's important for me. And when you can put others first and care about the things that they care about, it's going to come back to you. Mm. And then and, and the spotlight is on them, isn't it? More, more than about proving yourself and you're way more comfortable in your own skin and you, yeah. you know, it's not about you. You're not there to prove anything. You're there to serve. And as you rightly Absolutely. said, you, you have that in mind is what's the end feeling? Do, do I want them to introspect? Do I want to leave them on a high? Do I want them to rethink their life and their priorities? That all helps to p keep things on track. Your, I, I, um, I, I, would, uh -huh. I, would, I would I would even rephrase slightly is that, yes, there are all these questions about what I want them to do or may not want them to do. Mm -hmm. But the more important question is, what do they want? Mm -hmm. What do they need? Mm -hmm. You know, what's going to make their life better or happier? Or, right, you know, right. Uh, That's where your research you comes in beforehand. Mm -hmm. When I perform in a new country, if I go to Singapore, I will find, I will tell the promoter to keep the last 10 days worth of newspapers. I'll read up about their history, their politics, their news, their recent scandals. I will right. talk to locals, to taxi drivers, to find out their point of view on uh -huh. all these things. Mm -hmm. And my first 10 minutes is purely about them. And from their point of view, they're like, oh, he's talking about things that matter to us. Right. He's not an outsider anymore, you know, so he's one of us. He knows what's going on. He's made the effort to mm. understand the things that I care about. I did sure. a show recently, a private event in Goa mm -hmm. uh, for about 70 people. I did 40 minutes of material purely about them. Mm. I knew every single person in the group, what their issues were, what their, I mean, I'm doing a show for another organization quite soon. I know about the entire top management. I know mm -hmm. more about their business than they know about their business. Wow. Because I've mm -hmm. spent eight hours just talking to people in the company and finding out. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes it unique and special because it's about them and not mm -hmm. about you. And, and I think that underlines the fact that there are no shortcuts. People have this misconception that, you know, there's probably a shortcut to public speaking somewhere or CJ was always this spontaneous and had a sharp observation, the gift of the gab, you know, uh, as they say, there's a lot of hard work, as you said, behind the scenes going on, trying to understand, putting them first, learning about their world and then proceeding from that. And this is where most of the people who want to improve their public speaking or influencing or leadership skill, this is where they fail, they, they sort of, um, they over look this step you know what tends to happen now with uh, social media is you know people create a five minute clip it uh -huh. goes viral on the internet right you know you get let's say 10 million views and you're in a position to fill up a thousand seater auditorium right and people come in mm. to watch you mm -hmm. but then what do you do mm. you know five minutes on the internet is not mm -hmm. going to teach you how to hold a live audience for an hour absolutely so absolutely. it's very because important because you've not been in that position right it's very important to learn the trade before mm -hmm. you learn the tricks of the trade. Mm. Well said. And people are trying to learn the tricks of the trade first. Uh-huh.
That's uh, shortcuts all the time, and they sell shortcuts. Sell, you know. Talk about a weight loss pill today. We will help people lose weight without go- without going to the gym, without exercising, without dieting, and you'll have lots of takers for that, right? Yeah. We live in a world where people are drawn to shortcuts, but there are none. Um, thank you for for that. And then, what what led you into motivational speaking? What was uh, because uh, into executive coaching? I understand that you were doing some work. side by side with stand up comedy as well you were doing executive coaching parallel to that what what led me to executive coaching was poverty <laughs> <laughs> that's an honest answer <laughs> because i was completely broke i uh-huh. joined this recruitment firm in london so right. i used to work in the day and perform at night you know it supported mm. my comedy mm. and then one of my clients was a company that did, did executive coaching mm-hmm. so i qualified as a coach with them and mm. uh, i would just say i'm free on so and so days get me work Mm-hmm. and they would say okay google wants to run this workshop in ireland um, mm. you know nike wants to run this in amsterdam so mm. with them i've trained all these companies all over the world right. and i found uh, that it was really interesting because in stand up comedy you're the star you're standing in front but in coaching they're the stars and it's mm-hmm. your job to serve the less you speak the more successful the session is absolutely and i really started enjoying that as well and then over the course of time i found that I was able to create my own content which combined the two worlds mm-hmm. because there is so much you can bring from comedy which mm-hmm. teaches you about uh, which brings you skills and points of view that are valuable in business and vice versa there's stuff from business that you can apply in comedy as well right really would love to hear about that a little bit <laughs> as we move forward yeah i mean everything it's a uh, you know marketing branding i mean from a business point of view to comedy mm-hmm. you know there are so many other things you learn I remember in comedy one of the things I learned which is valuable in business is that you are super hot for the 20 minutes after you've nailed the gig. Mm. I remember in the UK it used to take 6 months before you could get a booking for a show because there right. were so many new comedians who wanted that slot. Mm-hmm. But if I had a good show I would mm-hmm. immediately go to the promoter that night after the show saying when can I get another slot in right. because he's got that memory of you in his head uh-huh, I would call him the next morning and book a right. slot in the diary. Mm-hmm. So even when I've come back to India I I do a corporate show and I'll stick around afterwards you know I'll meet the audience I'll talk to them I remember I did a show in in Mumbai once and I came home and in my pocket I had the business cards of 35 CEOs and I remember thinking as a consultant I would have chopped an arm off mm-hmm. for this kind of networking right but as a comedian people were literally just giving it to me sure and almost all my work I've got is from people who have seen me at shows right so i think that's something to keep in mo- keep in mind that you know when you do a piece of work for a client uh-huh. can you follow up as soon as possible right. to try and get in that next piece of work to build Because on that success in that moment mm-hmm. they realize you know the value that you bring to the table mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sure and why why is business um, have you have you helped business folks loosen up a little bit why is this supposed to be all all serious you know especially <laughs> i'm uh, especially here in india sometimes we take things uh, very very seriously and that's considered to be sort of the benchmark of you know being a good leader or a good boss or a good employee and you know yeah i think that's something on? that really needs to change mm. you know I think people are now starting to realize that you need to have fun at work. You know, mental mm-hmm. health is a big issue. Right. And especially with the pandemic and people working from home, they're working uh-huh. 24 hours. Right. And people are now starting to really realize the value of humor. Mm. And also humor is an invaluable tool when it comes to leadership. Mm-hmm. You know, humor can help you charm and and disarm It can Absolutely. help you with negotiation. It can help you with relationships. It can help you with leading your team. Mm-hmm. It can, if you, it shows humility. If you can use some self-deprecating humor. Uh, right. That being said, uh, the research shows that it's slightly different for men than it is for women. Really? Uh, unfortunately, mm-hmm. it's sad to mm-hmm. see uh, because when men make fun of themselves, they use self-deprecating humor in the workplace. Pe- they are seen as more powerful and more humble, mm-hmm. whereas with women who make fun of themselves uh, mm. they they are seen as undermining themselves mm. at least that's what the research shows mm-hmm. i don't believe it i think mm-hmm. if somebody has the ability to laugh at themselves uh, that's the kind of person i want to spend time it, with it's a super wow man isn't it in today's world where everybody is so careful about you know their self image and every selfie on instagram is so carefully um, put put together with all the filters it's a super power to be yourself to laugh at yourself yeah, yeah. and um and thanks it, to it, it, people 
Mm-hmm. It, so it's a, it's a big challenge. You're absolutely right. The problem with all this social media is people are starting to get their sense of self-worth from external validation. Absolutely. And that's a very dangerous place to let your emotions and your mood and your everything be con- be in the hands of somebody else. Right. You know, you right. see teenagers in schools where how many likes, how many comments. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and it's very, one needs to be very careful of that. And that's a benchmark of popularity now these days among teenagers, you know, is uh, then they go to whatever lengths they have to, to ensure that popularity, which is very, very dangerous, I believe, from, from these yeah. social media things. Um, but glad to have people like you, you know, especially this crossover from comedy into the business world, because I'm no stand-up comedian myself, but I've had situations in live presentations when there is something funny, obviously, they can, you know, the punchline of a story or something that happened in the business world. And people look up to, they're looking at each other for uh, cues as if, are they going to laugh? If they laugh, I'll laugh too. (laughs) Or is the boss going to laugh? If the boss laughs, we'll laugh too. (laughs) Or is the expat in the room laughing about this? If the expat laughs, everybody's like, yeah, Yeah. okay, this is funny, right? And we need... (laughs) So I've got to tell you this, you know, every single corporate show that I'm invited for, you know, Uh before the show, I'm told this is what our brand stands for. This is what our values are. You know, you need to do a clean show. It's got to be, you know, nothing... Mm-hmm. You get there on the day and mm. everybody has two drinks and they want the naughty stuff. Masala. Right? <laughs> but yeah, the masala as they call it. But if something goes wrong, you have to take the blame. Mm. So right. there is a level of psychological gamesmanship right. uh, that takes place. So mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. I was doing a show for Tata Consultancy Services right. many years ago, maybe a decade ago. They had called 300 CIOs. So I got on stage and I said, listen, I'm here on behalf of TCS. They understand their brand, mm. but I understand human behavior. Right. Now, if you can understand that Papa CJ is mm. completely separate to the TCS brand, I can give you a slightly naughtier show. Mm-hmm. Give me a chair if you want a clean show, complete mm. silence. Okay. Give me a chair if you want a naughty show, 300 people cheer. All right. <laughs> and these are then CIOs. I look at the client. Right. Then mm. I look at the most senior most person in the client. I said, sir, what do you suggest we do? Mm. He says, well, you give them what they want. Mm. The brand is safe. The right. audience gets what they want. Uh-huh. I can do what I want. You're still not and safe. Everybody's happy. Everybody's <laughs> happy. No, no, no. And also, there's no recordings allowed of the show, so there's no evidence. <laughs> fair, fair enough that you said it. Okay, that's that's clever. That's the right way to do it. <laughs> Wonderful. It's been a fantastic conversation here, CJ. Virtual high five to you, my friend. Thank Boom. you so much for being so open and about your journey. Any parting words of wisdom, uh, you know, inspiration for us, especially for our young audiences uh, who, who get feel they're stuck and, you know, there's no opportunities. I need to be someplace else, doing something else in order to discover my best. And um, what are the main lessons from your life journey? Life full of risks and uh, trying out all these crazy yeah. things. Uh, what would you like to say? So before any parting words, I will say this. Uh, Firstly, thank you so much for having me here. And I really appreciate the fact that you have made the effort to read my book and do the research to make this a meaningful conversation. A wonderful book, by the way, guys. Wonderful book. I think that is something that everybody watching should learn from. You know, that it's not just two guys chatting, but there's a lot of work that goes behind it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any parting words of wisdom? Not really here. I think Mm. just live your life to the fullest. If you're ever in a stressful situation, Mm -hmm. think about yourself 40 years from now on your deathbed and ask yourself, will, you know, will this stressful situation really matter? I think in 90% of cases, uh, you'll find the answer to that is no. Mm -hmm. And for me, I've always believed that relationships are what matter the most. You know, uh, almost all of our greatest regrets are that we didn't get to spend enough time with the people we loved. Sure. So, you know, cherish those moments while you have them. Mm -hmm. And uh, as cliche as the saying might be, uh, don't let the world change your smile. Mm -hmm. Let your smile change the world. Wow. So yeah, be be good to people, be nice to people, be a good human being. And I strongly believe in karma. If you can seek out opportunities to do good for others Mm -hmm. and make their lives better, it will come back to you one way or the other. Wow. Up to serious okay, yaar, such me. <laughs> <laughs> Closing words. You know, yeah, <laughs> no, I love that. And I, I've lived that message. I believe in it. That if you if you ask the universe, if you ask the world, how can I serve? 
um, there are forces in return which will ask you, how can we serve you? And, and that, that sort of amazing magic will happen in your lives. Uh, you're a wonderful human being, my friend, uh, a ray of hope uh, for many. Um, and um, a living example of not to take yourself or your life to seriously go out and live the dream. Thank you so much for joining us on this conversation. Thanks a lot, Simar. All Thank the best. You. Cheers, my friend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.